Well, first of all, uh, it's great to be here. And uh, is this working? Yeah. It's great to be here. It's great to be back uh, at BYU. I graduated uh, not that long ago. It was nine years ago, which for you guys seems like a long time. I actually had hair back then. So uh, a little bit's changed, but it, it feels like it wasn't that long ago. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, this startup that, that I started uh, a year ago. But before, before I get into that and, and get into a little more details of, of how I became an entrepreneur and tell you a little bit about the, the two startups I've been involved with, um, I'm going to uh, show a quick video. Um, and I hope this video, along with my presentation, can help um, inspire some of you to go off and start careers as entrepreneurs, to go start businesses, to change the world, to make the world a better place, and uh, to do something extraordinary. Uh, of course, many of you will also go work for, for companies, um, large companies, maybe you know, a lot of people at BYU go work for accounting firms and, and other great companies. But especially while you're a student, I think this is a great time for you to explore uh, other opportunities uh, in entrepreneurship. The desire to create is one of the deepest yearnings of the human soul. No matter our talents, education, backgrounds, or abilities, we each have an inherent wish to create something that did not exist before. Everyone can create. You don't need money, position, or influence in order to create something of substance or beauty. You might say I'm not the creative type. If that is how you feel, think again and remember that you are spirit daughters of the most creative being in the universe. Isn't it remarkable to think that your very spirits are fashioned by an endlessly creative and eternally compassionate God? Think about it. Your spirit body is a masterpiece created with a beauty, function, and capacity beyond imagination. trust and rely upon the spirit, the greater your capacity to create. So that's, uh, I think, just a great message uh, by President Nukdorf, And I think it really applies um, to anyone that's looking to uh, or thinking about becoming an entrepreneur. Uh, becoming an entrepreneur is more than about money. And I think a lot of people, the first thing you think of is, oh, an entrepreneur, you can go, you know, maybe make a lot of money if, if things go well. But um, being an entrepreneur is about creating something that hasn't existed before. It's about doing something um, that, uh, that betters yourself and that betters others. And I think there's a few great quotes here um, that, I, that I'd actually encourage all of you to go actually read this talk, the actual talk. This, this clip had a few little pieces that were great. These are some of my favorite pieces of it. But um, as you kind of read through these, you'll see that really um, being an entrepreneur, I believe, is uh, probably the, one of the, I think, one of the greatest callings you can have uh, as a profession because you're actually learning to create as God creates. And you learn lessons about working with people, about leading and managing, about um, learning from mistakes that you make and, and figuring out ways to be, become better. And so um, with that, I'm going to kind of kick things off. Um, I'm going to start a little bit just telling you a brief background about baby.com.br uh, or kind of where we're at right now. Then I'm going to kind of go back um, to the time that I was graduating from BYU. And then I'm going to go back into baby and tell you a little bit more details about how we came up with the idea and some processes that maybe you guys can learn from um, your own businesses. So um, as it was mentioned, um, baby.com.br is an e-commerce business in Brazil. 
We sell baby products. And we launched uh, 12 months ago, almost to the day. And since then, we've raised about $23 million from some incredible uh, VCs, Excel, who was the first investor in Facebook. Um, they also invested in diapers.com, which was, is the, one of the leading uh, baby uh, e-commerce companies in the United States. Um, they also, uh, we also have Tiger as a, as a huge investor. I was actually just in New York at a, um, a conference they have for CEOs from around the world. Uh, an incredible group, uh, very under the radar. Uh, they actually don't even have a website, uh, but they have $14 billion under management. A lot of people haven't heard of them. And then Monashi's Capital is a, a Brazilian investor, the, the leading VC in Brazil who invested in us as well. Um, one fun thing is uh, we actually have over a million Facebook fans on our, on, our, on our Facebook page. And so this is kind of an accomplishment and also indicative of, of what we're trying to do, which is uh, create a community, a community where moms can help one another, where they can learn from each other, and um, where we can also build our brand with these moms on a daily basis. So I'm going to jump back now to 2004. Uh, I had actually I graduated in December of, of 2003. And a few months after that, I started a company with my cousin. And this, this company uh, is called PoolTables.com. We actually came up with a handful of different ideas. We wanted to do something entrepreneurial. We wanted to work together. And in talking to one of my, one of my friends, I was, in a, I was in a young men's presidency, and the young men's president worked for eBay. And uh, at Mutual and I, we were just talking about uh, eBay, and he was, just, you know, he was telling me all about it. And at this time, I didn't have a lot of experience with eBay, but I, I started dabbling with it, and I, just, I thought it was really fun. It was like, you know, if, if anyone's taken an economics class, it's like the invisible hand, you know, <laughs> supply and demand. And um, I, I did a, a few little fun things with it and, and really enjoyed it, but didn't really think about using it to create a business until this conversation. And, and I asked him, who are some of the biggest retailers on eBay? And he mentioned an electronics company, and then he mentioned a pool table company. And when he said a pool table company, it just clicked. Uh, I had been brainstorming ideas with my cousin, and I just immediately thought, I could do that. That's not that hard. I bet we could manufacture these in China. And so within two weeks, my cousin and I flew out to China. Uh, neither of us uh, spoke Chinese or had really been to China. Uh, so we just showed up, and we started visiting some factories. And we ended up placing some orders. We uh, put up a listing on, on eBay, and we... We actually told people on eBay that it was, there was a 10-week lead time. They were, they were going to have a custom-built table. And we basically used this money. We started selling tables every day. And we used that money that we were collecting to actually finance the tables that we were making in China. And it was really fun. I mean, the first year, uh, we generated a million dollars in revenue. Uh, it was 100% bootstrapped. We didn't, we didn't go raise money from VCs. Uh, but we, we raised money from uh, friends and family members. Uh, one, of, one of them is, is here, my dad. Uh, and it was, it was, they really, you know, it was tough to, to raise money from friends and family because as, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, but it puts a lot of stress on an entrepreneur because you just, especially in, maybe you're, maybe someone's parents here have just endless piles of money and you, it doesn't matter if they lose money, but um, you know, the people who are borrowing money from it, it mattered. You know, we couldn't lose this money. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a little bit. But we did this business for six years, and we ended up having the largest retailer pool tables in the U.S. We had, um, we ended up uh, selling, of course, online, and we also had retail stores in Utah, in Georgia, and New Jersey, and now there's also a store in, in Portland, Oregon. And after about six years, uh, five and a half years or so, we, we decided we were ready for a change. So we, uh, all of our entrepreneur friends thought we were crazy, but we basically walked away from our business and we went to business school. And my, my cousin went to Harvard Business School, I went to Wharton. And when we were in business school, we ended up, we ended up selling PoolTables.com while we were in school. But a lot of our friends that were entrepreneurs didn't understand why we would want to go back to school and get an MBA that was you know, very expensive, um, walking away from a business that was doing well. But we really, th we really felt like there was an opportunity for us to do something even bigger. 
And we thought that going back to school would be a perfect time for us to go reflect on the, on the experiences that we'd had and to build on those experiences. So a few things that we learned with PoolTables.com. We learned that market size mattered. Uh, we were in a, a kind of this niche market, not really exciting, not really sexy, uh, but we were able to disrupt it. And it was a lot of fun to do that. But after four or five years, the growth kind of plateaued. Part of that was because of the US economy. And part of that was just the fact that the market was so small. The pool table market, not that many people buy pool tables. And expanding internationally with pool tables just wasn't going to happen. People don't buy pool tables for their homes uh, really anywhere else in the world. Um, some other things we learned was uh, that retail stores are very hard to scale. Uh, as we wanted to grow the business, we found it was a lot easier to just dump more money into the online part of the business. And we could, see, we could double our sales overnight by doing that. Where building retail stores, it would take six months to identify the right location and, and negotiate the lease. It would then go take uh, a lot of money to go invest in the store. It would take about a year to create enough awareness in the local market that we were there. So it just took a lot of time and, and money to build, uh, to build that. That said, we had great margins with our physical retail stores better than we did online. So the two together worked well. The other thing we learned was that people matter. Um, we, because we had bootstrapped this business, we hired people that we could afford. And oftentimes that meant that we were hiring people that weren't A players. These are kind of B players. And uh, oftentimes we had maybe one A player, and then the rest were kind of B players. And so this became uh, something that was really kind of a thorn in our side as we tried to grow the business, is that we were always having to babysit um, you know, a, a lot of our team. So we kind of went with those experiences to business school. And we um, decided, hey, let's, let's go do this again. So we spent the whole first year in business school brainstorming ideas. And we came up with 60 business ideas, um, legitimate business ideas during that first year in school. We kept a shared Google Doc between us. We each had a tab. And we just listed our ideas. And in one sentence, not very detailed. We didn't do a deep dive into each idea. Just a very general one sentence idea uh, or explanation of each idea. Then we. Um, when all of our friends went and did internships, um, we spent about 11 or 12 weeks of that summer. Uh, we went, actually went out to Silicon Valley. So my cousin was in Boston. I was in Philadelphia. We decided, hey, let's go, let's go someplace where we have no distractions, where we can just focus entirely on entrepreneurship, where we're surrounded by entrepreneurs. So we went to Silicon Valley. And we went and spent some time on Stanford campus, um, where we had some friends that were students there that got us access to the library. We also worked out of a garage in, the, in a home I was renting uh, with my family there. And we just whittled those ideas down. So we took the 60 ideas, and we cut those 60 ideas down to four ideas within about a week or week and a half. And then from there, we spent the rest of the summer on those four ideas until we came down to one. Now, I'm going to explain this process a little more in detail, but there's basically four steps um, to this process. And before I do that, just one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of times you think the bigger the idea, the riskier it is. And that's, I want to get that out of your minds. That's actually not true. Um, a perfect example are these two businesses that I've done, PoolTables.com, Baby.com.br. PoolTables.com was a lot higher risk for me personally because I had borrowed money from friends and family. And so for me, it was high risk. If, I, if this thing failed, my life was ruined. I'd be like, till, probably about until I was like 50 years old, I'd be paying back these people their money, right? And uh, baby.com.br, which is a much bigger opportunity, a billion, a billion dollar opportunity, is something that we uh, really have no risk. We went and raised $23 million from somebody else, and these are professional investors. If we lose the money, uh, you know, we're not out, out a whole lot. We're still pay we're paying ourselves salaries. Um, so it's a lot lower risk, even though we're swinging for the fences. So, um, don't necessarily think that the smaller the idea, the less risky. Okay? And I'll, conversely, the bigger the idea doesn't necessarily mean there's no risk. Uh, you keep that in mind. So I'm going to go through these four steps, um, starting with idea generation. And you can see here it's kind of like a funnel. And basically, the more ideas that you pump into the top of the funnel, the higher chance you have of having a success down at the bottom. So a, a little example. Um, if we wanted to find the tallest person in the United States, um, what's the chance that we'd find that person in this room? It's probably pretty low. Or someone that's maybe close to the same height. 
it's probably pretty low. But if we went to all of, all of Salt Lake City or all of Utah and said, okay, you know, is the tallest person in Utah close to the tallest person in the, world, in, in the United States? It's going to be a lot closer. Um, so the same, the same thing applies here with ideas. The fewer ideas you have, the less chance of having a great idea. The more ideas you have, the better chance of having one of those ideas being an outstanding idea. So we'll start with idea generation. So the idea here is to start training your brain to start identifying pains in the market. And so this takes a little bit of practice, but uh, it gets easier over time. And even for me, there's times when I've gone in and out of this where I've wanted to generate new ideas. And the first few days, it's, it's kind of tough. You have to start forcing yourself to do this again. But as you start getting in the habit, it gets easier and easier and easier to do. And you need to start writing these down. Every idea that you have, you have to write down in one place or it's pointless. The whole exercise is pointless if you're not writing down the ideas. Um, the other thing is you want to make sure that you're not overanalyzing ideas. So a, a great example. When I was at Wharton, um, I came back from that summer and I had identified this baby business. We were going to do this baby business in Brazil. And I started telling friends about it at school. And a couple of my friends said, hey, you know, one of our other friends uh, th that I knew is doing this, a similar business. He's wanted to do a similar business, but in Spain. Uh, this friend of ours was, was from Spain, and he wanted to do a baby e-commerce business in Spain. And so uh, I went and met with him, and we started comparing notes, and he had done a lot of work on the model, the financial model. So he brought up this Excel spreadsheet that was insane. I mean, this guy had really modeled out every little piece of this business. And I was kind of embarrassed, because like, we did not have a model like that. We had spent the time doing, you know, basically spent a lot of the summer cutting down to this idea. And then I'd spent a lot of time doing a few other things, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But um, as the year went on, we started making huge leaps in, in, in progressing towards building this business. And this friend, every time I talked to him, he was still working on his financial model. And he kept saying, oh, it's not quite right yet. I'm still working on the model. And by the end of the year, we graduated. And I had raised a bunch of venture capital money. I had a team in Brazil working. Um, and he was still working on his financial model. So you have to be careful to not overanalyze. You, you do need to analyze, but not overanalyze. Um, something else that's really helpful is doing this exercise with somebody else. Um, I find it very useful to be sharing these ideas with someone, build off the ideas. Sometimes you have an idea and you think it might be, it might be really good, and you just need someone to say, no, that's really just a dumb idea. And then other times you come up with an idea and you're not sure how good it is and you need that other person to be like, hey, that is a brilliant idea. Let's like dig into that a little bit more. So do this with someone else if you can. The next step is vetting. So this vetting process is very quick. Um, again, this is not like a, a deep dive into the business. This is um, looking to basically do a thumbs up or a thumbs down as quickly as possible. So the idea here is Start looking at competitors. You know, is there someone else already in the space doing this? Have they already raised money? If the answer is yes, thumbs down. Ideas, you know, you don't want to compete with someone that's already doing this very well. Um, so basically, you're doing very quick and dirty research on each company and just giving it a thumbs up or thumbs down. This is the, this part of the, the phase where we took 60 ideas down to four in about a week or a week and a half. So you're not spending a whole lot of time, maybe an hour or two on each idea, um, maybe less, maybe a little more. But these are some of the questions that you're going to want to ask you know, about competitors, how big is my market. So if you, let's say you're, you're wanting to build a, a $100 million business. Um, maybe set that as, as, something, as a qualifier for these ideas. And if it's something that's like, man, we might not even make a million dollars with this business, thumbs down. Okay? So these are all things that you're going to want to think about. Is it scalable? Is this something that can really grow? You know, I, um, I came to a campus a, a few years ago and spoke, and someone talked to me about an idea that they had. And, as they talked about the idea, it just wasn't scalable. And as I asked some questions, this, this student started to realize, man, no matter what I do, no matter how many of these I sell, this, I, this just won't ever get over a million dollars, which means it's going to be really tough to pay myself a salary, to, have, to pay employee salaries, to pay for an office. So something to be thinking about. The next step is testing. Now, this, this takes the most time. This is where you're going to take the best ideas that you have, and you're really going to spend some time on them. And it's not just analyzing. That's a big part of it. But it's also um, conducting feasibility tests. So I'm going to give you one example. Um, in 2004, before we started the pool tables business, 
um, my cousin and I were evaluating a number of different ideas. I had done an internship in Peru while I was a student at BYU. And I'd seen that uh, these women were walking around the streets selling huge bouquets for like $2. And it blew my mind. It was like, man, these roses are stunning and they're like free. It's so cheap. And I, I just kept thinking of all the times I bought girlfriends flowers, like, you know, especially on Valentine's Day. You know, you're spending like $40, $50, $60 or more. And so I just, I always kind of had that in my mind. So I told my cousin as we were exploring ideas, hey, this could be a fun idea. So I started looking at importing a container of flowers from Peru or Ecuador for Valentine's Day. As we dug deeper into this, I kind of realized, hey, this is high risk. You know, it's a container. These are perishable goods. What if it gets stuck in customs? Or what if the container arrives, everything's like wilted? So we decided to, to do a, a feasibility test in a cheaper way and, a, and, and with lower risk. And that was, let's go to Costco. Costco sells uh, a, you know, a dozen roses for like $13 on Valentine's Day. Um, but all these other flower shops are selling them for like triple that price or quadruple the price. So we went around and we talked to every major business in Utah Valley. And we told them, hey, we are going to provide a service to your employees. We are going to deliver roses on Valentine's Day um, to your office. Uh, you're not going to have employees leaving during the middle of the day to go buy roses. Um, and we're going to sell them for $29.99. It's a better price than they're going to find elsewhere, and it's very convenient. Good for them, good for the company, good for everybody. And these companies loved it. So they started sending out emails to all their employees saying, hey, FYI, if you need to order roses for Valentine's Day, these guys are going to be delivering them, and you can just pay by PayPal. And it was great. We sold um, something like five or 600 dozen roses, pre-sold them. And then uh, Valentine's Day morning, we went to a few different Costco's, and we were the first ones at the door. We went and bought out like three Costco's of all the roses. <laughs> and uh, we actually started to get overconfident. So we pre-sold all these roses and we thought, man, when other people start walking in with the roses, all their workmates are going to be like, hey, that's a good idea. I should go buy some myself. So we ordered several hundred extra roses. And then we started delivering them. And number one, we found out we are horrible delivery people. We're like, we're late. We're like, you know, we were trying to box these, in, like put them in these nice little boxes, and it was taking longer than we thought. So we were running behind throughout the day. And we started having people calling us, like Omniture was calling us, you know, where are the roses? You know, people are about to leave for the day. You know, it was just really stressful. And the day was kind of wrapping up, and we realized we have 200 roses that we are not going to sell. And so we started panicking. And, uh, you know, I had a cousin, he went out, out to a street corner, like a busy intersection, and started selling them. A homeless guy in a shopping cart pulls up with roses, too, and starts selling roses next to my cousin. <laughs> like, really embarrassing. I go to the University Mall, and I start standing outside one of the doors. No one's buying them, so I go into the mall. Uh, mall security gets called somehow. They escort me out of the mall. Um, just like a really embarrassing day overall. And I learned, number one, I hate roses. I'm never going to buy roses again. And uh, number two, this is just not a great business because it's like one day a year, and if anything goes wrong, it's like the rest of the year is shot. So this is just a, you know, just a quick example of how to conduct a feasibility test. We actually ended up uh, breaking even on this kind of deal, maybe made a couple hundred dollars, uh, definitely not worth the time or the gas we spent. Um, and we, but we did the same kind of feasibility test in Silicon Valley with these four ideas we had. We went and spent, like one of the ideas, we went and spent $500. We found some developers in India or Pakistan that developed the site for us, very basic. And then we um, spent $100 on Google AdWords, which Google does, like your first time you're doing something, they give you like $100 free. So we basically just use free AdWord money from Google to test this. And so you can do different feasibility tests in order to see how great your idea is going to be. Um, so once you, once you do this, um, you're going to hopefully be narrowing these ideas down. And these are some things you're going to be, you're going to be asking yourself. Do I want to spend the next five or 10 years of my life doing this idea? Because uh, realistically, that's what's going to happen. Even if it fails, you're likely going to spend a lot of years doing this. And also, is there a road to profitability? How, how is this going to work? Am I going to be able to break even? With PoolTables.com, we broke even our first month. Um, and we, started, we were profitable uh, you know, month two. So that was, for us, there was a great road to profitability. With baby.com.br, it's a lot different model. You know, we're investing tens of millions of dollars into a business that's going to become profitable in two to three years. And, but 
um, you know, we were able to raise money to help us get to that point. So these are things that you're going to need to ask yourself about your business. The next step is executing. So this is when you have to get crazy. So once you've decided that this is your idea, you have to seriously become an animal. And you have to make your life mission to make sure that this business works. So start small, but always think big. You have to have a, a vision for what you're going to accomplish and just start tackling the small problems first. Um, be ready to adapt and to change. Oftentimes your idea that you're going to do a year from now isn't the same as the, f the first idea that you had. Um, this is when you're going to start uh, building your team. So um, in Brazil, what I did before, I even, I'd never even been to Brazil uh, when, we started, when we were starting this business. Had never even been. But I started contacting, I emailed somewhere between 100 and 150 people in Brazil uh, when I was in Silicon Valley through LinkedIn. I just went and looked at anyone at LinkedIn that had been to Wharton, had been to Harvard, and had worked in the internet space or e-commerce. Then I just started doing a search for anyone that was like a CEO or a leader of an e-commerce company in Brazil. And I just emailed everyone. And then I flew down to Brazil for the first time, and I spent a week meeting with as many of these people as I could. And I just tried to understand, what is the market like? What are your biggest challenges? Who are the people I should be talking to? If we're going to build a team, who do you recommend that I would hire as my first employee? And so this was uh, a way for me to really start understanding my market, and I started building a team. We ended up hiring uh, our first Brazilian employee while I was still in business school. I was traveling. I ended up my last semester, I got all my classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I would fly out um, to Brazil right after my last class on Thursday. I'd fly, out, fly to Brazil that night. I'd get there to Sao Paulo early in the morning on Friday. We'd work Friday, Saturday, Sunday I'd go to church. Monday I'd work all over again. And then Monday night I'd fly back to school and I'd get to class right in time on Tuesday morning tough like my last semester was not fun um, but I graduated and uh, and we successfully were able to build a great team and um, this team piece is is critical if you don't have a great team your business will fail and so you need to spend time building the best business you can don't hire friends just because you like working with them because chances are you're not gonna like working with them after a while um, Relationships can be strained in business. I actually hired my best man uh, at PoolTables.com, our first hire, and I had to fire him. It was a tough, tough thing. And so you really just want to hire the best people you can find. So at, at Baby, we went out and looked in the market, and we said, okay, we need a logistics person. Who is the best person that runs logistics in Brazil? We went and find this, we found this woman uh, who runs Walmart.com.br, the Walmart e-commerce division in Brazil, their logistics operation. We went and hired her. Um, we need a great buyer, someone that's been in the baby space already. We went to Carrefour, which is one of the biggest, it's like a Walmart of Europe and, and Latin America and a, a big chunk of the world. Um, we went and hired their baby buyer. She'd been in the baby space for 12 years. She's a mom. And we went and hired her. So we just went out and we started hiring people that had done this stuff, who had a lot of experience, who were smarter than us, who understood the space much better than we did. And so that's what, the kind of, that's what you need to be doing as far as team building. So um, why, why did we choose Brazil? And why did, why did we choose the baby space? Um, actually, how much, how much time do I have? Till, is it till 4.20? OK. Um, so we ended up evaluating a lot of ideas. Of our 60 ideas, this is the only one in Brazil. And a lot of them weren't even, most of them weren't even e-commerce businesses. Very few of them were. But as we started evaluating um, ideas and coming up with ideas, I ended up, when I was in school, I talked to a Brazilian classmate. I had a number of friends that were Brazilian. This friend, his, his wife was pregnant uh, with her first baby. And he was telling me how expensive baby products were in Brazil. And we started talking about how what a great opportunity this would be to create something like diapers.com in Brazil. He hadn't heard of diapers.com. I had met the founders a number of years before. So I started explaining this business model of creating a niche category in, in e-commerce targeting, targeting moms. And um, as we started exploring all of our different ideas, we just kept coming back to this opportunity. And let me tell you a little bit why. I, I spent um, the first part of the summer before going to Silicon Valley, I went to spend a month in Mexico um, working for Alta Ventures Mexico. Actually, this Nail It and Scale It book that you guys are, are reading uh, was co-written co by Paul Alstrom, the founder of, of Alta Ventures Mexico. And so I went and worked with this VC for a month um, so I could, as an entrepreneur in residence, evaluating opportunities in, Brazil, in Mexico 
and helping them also get their, their, their fund um, going. And so um, let me just compare um, these two countries and you can kind of get an idea of why Brazil became so attractive. And uh, these are both large emerging economies, some of the biggest countries in the world. Um, Mexico is 120 million people, Brazil 200 million. Um, you can see GDP, Brazil's is double what Mexico's is. Um, internet penetration, this is a key number for us. So when we started looking at Brazil, it's about 45% internet penetration. India is somewhere around 10%, somewhere around there. And so we felt like Brazil was at this perfect inflection point. In the US, it's somewhere around 80%, 75 or 80%. So we felt Brazil was at this perfect inflection point where it had a big enough base of internet users where there was actually uh, a possibility to launch a business and get traction immediately. But it was also young enough that there weren't a lot of competitors in the space. And also, we had a lot of built-in growth because the internet was going to be growing no matter what. Even if the macro economy slowed down, um, internet space is only going to grow. So we felt like there was built-in growth there. Um, so it wasn't a mature market like the US is. Um, internet users, you can see double in Brazil. Um, you can see B2C e-commerce sales. This is a huge number. You can see it's, it's almost four times Mexico's number. These are uh, sales of e-commerce, of e uh, e-commerce sales in, in country. So you can see in Brazil, kind of going from this point to this point, um, it's, it seems like not that big of a gap, but this is what happens is that it starts to grow. The more people you have growing uh, and using the internet, it takes a little bit of time, but they start consuming online. There's basically four phases of, of, of e-commerce development um, and, and the first one is basically people get an internet connection, they start consuming something online. It, it's, they don't, don't necessarily even pay for something. It might be just be consuming news online. The second phase is they actually start making some purchases, but low risk purchases. So like they, they might buy a Groupon, where it's like they don't have to receive a physical good, and it's a low dollar value, so it's, it's low risk. The third phase is where they actually start buying real products, like they start buying diapers or strollers or, or you know, these kind of goods where they already know what the product is. They don't need to go touch it and feel it and see it. They know, what, they, they, know they need a Pampers size 3. And, so, and they know they can get it. It's more convenient, and it's probably a better price online, so they start doing that. The fourth phase is maturity. That's where we're at in the U.S., where you have Amazon, where you, you just start buying everything online. You even buy your groceries online. When, we, when I lived in Philadelphia before moving to Brazil, we bought all of our groceries online. And it delivered to our door. And so Brazil is somewhere between the second and third phase, where people were starting to buy online, and uh, some people were actually starting to buy real goods online. And so it was just this perfect time. That's, this is where all the growth starts happening, through, between that second and third phase. So as we started evaluating markets, more and more we were just convinced that of all the countries in the world, we actually evaluated Indonesia, India, China, Turkey. We, we looked at every country that was emerging that had a large population. We just kept coming back to Brazil, and we really believed it was at this perfect inflection point. So we went out and started pitching to VCs. Um, our first pitch to a VC was up in New York. Um, we met in New York, my cousin and I. We went to this guy um, who had been recommended. He'd made investments. We were only targeting investors who had invested in diapers.com or who had invested in Brazil. Uh, if they had invested in one of those two things, we didn't want to talk to them. We, they had to believe in either the diapers.com model or in Brazil, or we just felt it was going to be a, a long shot to get them to invest. This guy had invested heavily in Brazil. We went and sat down with him. Um, we came into the office, first of all. He was on the phone in like a glass conference room yelling at somebody and uh, just screaming. And uh, we were, man, it was just making us really nervous because this is our first pitch to a VC. We didn't do this with PoolTables.com. And as he's yelling, we're just like, oh my gosh, like butterflies, feeling ill. And um, he ends up inviting us into the office. He sits down and just like crosses his arms and, just, and he just said, pitch. And we're like, all right. So we start going through our pitch, and he just sits there, and he just starts like hacking us, just like question after question, just really beating us up. And uh, man, we, were, we really started getting really, really nervous. And uh, he ended up, the phone rings. He picks up the phone, starts yelling at someone else for like 10 minutes in the middle of our pitch, puts the phone back down, and says, keep going. And we ended up spending like an hour and a half with this guy. And uh, we ended up walking out, and my cousin goes, man, he hated us. And uh, I actually said, I, I actually don't think so. He, this is the kind of guy that would never would have spent an hour and a half with us if he hated us. Uh, and my cousin said, you know what? I think you're right. He might have liked us. So 10 minutes later, <laughs> 10 minutes later, we get an email on our phones 
we're walking down the street in New York, and we get this, we get this email, and this guy says, I'm in. I want to invest a million dollars, and I'll give you a, a, what's called a two million pre-money valuation. But what that means is basically, we have a, the business he's saying is worth two million dollars. He's going to put in a million, making it worth three million now. Since he put in one million, he owns one third of the business. So we high five each other, and we said, we're never working with this guy, though. <laughs> Because he was, he was tough. You know? He was the kind of guy where we just thought, man, I don't know if I want to pick up the phone to talk to this guy because he, really, he was really rough. So we thought, this guy has a lot of experience. If we can get money from him, great. Uh, but if we can get money from others, I think we'd rather work with other people. And so we started thinking, OK, this is great validation. All we had was a PowerPoint. We didn't even have a name at this point. And um, we started talking. How can we increase the valuation of this business? We want to raise more than a million dollars to get started. We need a lot of money. And so we started coming up with ideas. We'd done a, a generic domain in the US. We'd done pooltables.com. And we knew the value of a generic domain. Um, now, generic domains are not cheap. Um, oftentimes, uh, a great domain can be hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so we started evaluating names. And one name that we came up with was baby.com.br. Uh, we had actually started with fraldas. And we realized later on, fraldas means, uh, fraldas means diapers in Portuguese. We found out that Brazilians hate the word. It just like is a really dirty word, way worse than diapers is in the US, which is hard to believe. Um, and also we found out that everyone uses .com.br in Brazil. Every domain is .com.br. So we bought that domain, and it was worthless. It was like we spent, not, luckily that domain was, was cheap. It was a few thousand dollars. Uh, but mistake. Shouldn't have bought it. We still have it. If anyone's interested, uh, let me know. Um, <laughs> So, but we found this other domain, Baby, and we're like, this domain is what we're talking about. Like, this is the best domain in the space. This is going to add real value to our business. And we needed that, because all we had was a PowerPoint at this point. So we started negotiating with the owner of this domain, and uh, I found out he'd bought 70 domains in 1999 and had sold zero of them. Uh, he was Brazilian. And uh, so I spent two months negotiating in broken Portuguese. I didn't serve my mission in Brazil. I served in, in Bolivia, Spanish speaking. So, uh, and I took a, a, a Portuguese class here at BYU, so I, I kind, of, kind of speak. So we, in broken Portuguese, I ended up negotiating with this guy for like two months. And it was very clear this guy was irrational. Um, this is why he had not sold a domain yet you know, in, in a dozen years. And, uh, but over time, I convinced him. It took about a month to get him to give us a, a range of, of what this domain would be worth. I said, just give us a range. So he said, a half million dollars to a million dollars. And it was like, OK, that's a lot of money. But in our own valuation, it was like his low end was kind of our high end of what this domain could be worth. So we came back with an offer. And we said, hey, look, here's an offer. And uh, uh, this is what we're going to pay you. but." we want to do one little change. And that is, we want to pay you over five years. This is what we did with the pooltables.com domain. So we knew this worked, where we just make monthly payments every, you know, every month for you know, four or five years. And we told the guy, if we ever miss a payment or make a late payment, the domain's yours. This is great for us because it's low risk. If this business fails after three or four or five months or we never raise money, well, we have only paid him for a few months of it. Okay? Um, and uh, he came back and said, oh, and I told him, you have until the end of the day today, or there's no deal. So let me know by the end of the day. He came back within two hours and said, you got a deal. Um, I'm going to do the deal. You can pay over five years. And as we're reading through all the details, we get to the very bottom. It says, but at the end of the, at the, end of the five year period, you need to give us a million dollars or 10% of revenue for 10 years. So I was, I was so frustrated. I, I couldn't believe it. Because I just spent, like, at this point, like a month and a half with this guy like almost every day. And I was about to beat my head against the wall. I was so frustrated. And uh, I just came back to him and I just said, look, no deal. Uh, this is like totally out of range of what, what we discussed before. Um, that said, let's, this is, it's Friday today. Let's wait till Monday. Let's connect. I don't think we're going to be able to do a deal. But let's just connect on Monday and just make sure. So I cooled down over the weekend. I was taking a great course at Wharton, um, a negotiations class, with one of the best negotiators on the planet. Uh, this guy uh, named Professor Diamond, he's uh, a Jewish guy, one of the savvy, most savvy negotiators you could ever meet. And I actually I went through all of the notes from this class, and just I, I started just saying, OK, I'm going to figure out. Uh, you, you learn that you can't reason with people. 
uh, in a negotiation. It's all about emotion. And so I, I stopped trying to reason with this guy. Because originally I was like trying to reason. Like, that doesn't make any sense. What you're asking for doesn't make any sense. You know, trying to explain why it doesn't make sense. This guy didn't care. Um, so I went back to him and said, hey, help me understand where you're coming from. And he started explaining that, hey, I'm in Brazil. There's, uh, the, the, you know, the economy has been volatile over my lifetime. Who knows what's going to happen? If you want to pay over five years, there could be inflation. There could be this and that and the other. I just need to hedge my bets. So I said, OK. So you're saying, if I gave you all the cash today, you would do the deal? And he said, yeah. So I said, OK. I've got a, a proposal. How about I wire you right now $5,000? And you give me 90 days and I'll give you the rest of the money in 90 days. If I don't give you the rest of the money in 90 days, you keep my five grand, no harm, no foul. If in 90 days I come back with the rest of the money, the domain's mine. And he said, deal. We signed some paper, some paperwork. I sent him the money, and I had 90 days to go sell the tar out of this business to VCs. <laughs> and, uh, and I did. And uh, my partner and I, went, we started pitching to all these VCs. We are baby.com.br. We're the best domain in the space. And we are gonna, we're going to crush it in Brazil. And investors believed us. And so we went and raised about $4.5 million with a PowerPoint. And we used that money to go buy, uh, some of that money to go buy the rest of this domain. So this is just a great example of how you can get creative. Uh, you know, I've had people say, oh, but you bought that domain. You had a lot of money. I don't have that kind of money. And the answer is no, you don't need a lot of money. You just need to get creative. That's all entrepreneurship is, is creativity. So. Um, we launched our business in October. We graduated. I moved down with my family, my, my wife and my two girls in July. We launched the site in October. Um, you can see this is uh, this woman right here. Her name is Angelica. She's the biggest female celebrity in Brazil. She is our CMO, our chief mommy officer. And uh, we use her image all over our site. Uh, when we launched our site, we had a huge PR event where we had every major newspaper, magazine, TV station, radio station in, in a room like this. And we told everyone. We, had, we contacted all of our contacts in, in, the, in the media. Her people contacted all their contacts in the media. And we had this event. And we told everyone we had a big announcement. And then we had Angelica walk in. And we were in every major news publication in Brazil. And it launched our business into the stratosphere overnight. And so um, and what we did, we didn't pay her anything. Um, we gave her equity in the business, a small piece of equity, very, a very small piece of equity that, sh that we told her and her husband. Her husband's also a celebrity. He has more Twitter followers than the New York Times, 7 million Facebook followers. These, this couple is a dynamic duo. They have, they just, she just had a baby a few weeks ago, her third baby. So everyone in Brazil knows them. Everyone loves them. And um, they came on board because we gave them some equity. And we told them this could be worth a big chunk of money if we execute. And they believed that we could. And uh, they actually ended up investing their own money into the business in the next round. Uh, so we actually, they actually paid us to, uh, to use their image on, on, our, on our site, which is great. Um, I'll do quite, I'm going to try to wrap it up just so, because I know some people are going to leave. But I'll, do Q, I'll stick around afterwards to do some Q&A. Um, just a few pictures really quick. This is uh, day one in our office. We had six employees. Um, I'm going to wrap this up. I know I have like one minute. Um, this is uh, one of our, th we have three offices now. We have 180 employees now. Um, this is our warehouse, uh, our first warehouse. This is our warehouse now. Uh, actually, a few months ago, we have, it's vertically, uh, we've verticalized the space now. So we have racks going up, up to the ceilings. Um, this is some of the team uh, that we built. I've already told you a little bit about how we hired great people from Walmart, Google, Nike. We just went and hired the best people we could find in the market. Um, I wish I could talk more about this, debt versus equity. When do you raise debt versus equity? If you have questions about this, um, I can tell you about it after. Um, frequently asked questions, um, we can maybe do this in the Q&A. If any of you guys have questions uh, similar to these or these questions, I'm happy to talk about them. Um, and uh, just to kind of wrap things up, um, like President Uchtdorf said, uh, one of the greatest yearnings of the human soul is to create. And I hope that each of you has a desire to identify what talents you have. Maybe it is to build a business. Maybe it's to do something else. 
but I encourage you all to create. It, it, it's incredible the happiness and fulfillment that you can have from creating something on your own. Uh, and you can do good. You can do good in the world. You can help build the kingdom. And that is my hope and my prayer for you guys, that each of you will leave this, uh, this room, that you'll be inspired to think about ways that you can create your own businesses, that you can impact the world for, for better. And um, I really appreciate uh, you giving me guys the time to be here. Thank you.